everyone. My name is Siam Rezwan, Chair of the Global Health Leaders Conference at Johns Hopkins University, and welcome to our session today with Dr. Joshua Sharfstein. Uh, for those of you watching the recording of this session, today is June 4th. To give you all an overview of the next 45 minutes, I'll first be introducing Dr. Sharfstein to you all, and myself and the director of our conference, Neha, have prepared some questions for Dr. Sharfstein. With the remaining time, we will be opening up the session for questions that you all have for Dr. Sharfstein. Today, we will be learning from Dr. Sharfstein about where we are in the current moment living through the COVID pandemic, reflecting on the past two years of this global health crisis, and looking to the future with respect to lessons we have and still have yet to learn. To introduce Dr. Sharfstein, he is Vice Dean of Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and Professor of the Practice in Health Policy and Management at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He's a pediatrician and the director of the Bloomberg American Health Initiative. Previously, he served as the Secretary of the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the Principal Deputy Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration, and as Commissioner of Health for Baltimore City in Maryland. Dr. Sharfstein is also co-host of an excellent podcast called Public Health on Call, which has been listened to and downloaded by millions around the world. Dr. Sharfstein has always done a phenomenal job in bridging the gap between experts and the public. Dr. Sharfstein, thanks so much for participating in our Global Health Leaders Conference once again. It's always an honor to have you with us. Well, it's a, it's a total pleasure. Thank you so much um, for having me. It's great to be here. And I really hope we do have time for questions because in previous years, I have really enjoyed the hearing what's on your mind and talking about whatever topic related to public health. Yeah, well, thank you so much again. Um, so I guess to kick things off, our first question that we have for you, Dr. Sharfstein, is uh, recent polls have shown that one in three Americans say that the COVID-19 pandemic is over. In your opinion, what is the current state of the pandemic in the United States, and does this differ from its state internationally? Uh, so that's a good question. You're jumping right into the heart of the pandemic. Um, you know, the pandemic is not over. We still see many, many cases around the world, um, many thousands of deaths um, uh, around the world every, every day and every week. Um, and so, you know, we're still coping and the virus is still out there trying to infect as many people as possible and being quite successful in doing that. It's certainly a different pandemic than when we started and we really didn't understand very much and we had almost no tools to defend against it. But um, the pandemic's still going, and, and it has, um, you know, a lot of implications both in the United States and around the world. In the United States, we have to um, be vigilant watching the pandemic. We have to recognize that there are moments where, um, and there are potential variants that are a greater risk, particularly uh, for people who are vulnerable to severe disease and death. We have to be thinking, I think one of the most important things in the United States is not only to get vaccinated, but to be on the lookout for getting sick because there's such effective treatment now available if you can get diagnosed fast enough. People who think it's over and think it's not a big deal can really get into trouble if they actually do get sick and then they aren't really thinking that it could be COVID and then the time runs out for them to get treated um, with some of these really effective treatments, then they could really get into trouble. So right now we're seeing uh, hospitalizations rise. We're seeing uh, some rise in deaths. And you know what happens this year is gonna have a lot to do with us, whether we can be more um, vigilant and thoughtful as their surges particularly, um, and also has a lot to do with the virus, like whether we see more, um, more different kinds of mutations that are dangerous. Now around the world, we still have a profound problem getting vaccinations to a lot of countries and um, opportunities for people to be vaccinated. And you know, this is a different challenge in different parts of the world. In some parts of the world, it doesn't have to do so much with the number of vaccines anymore, but it has a lot to do with the infrastructure to get people vaccines and resources for health clinics and outreach efforts. Um, and so you know, really making sure we're committing to support international health. We also have to be thinking, in my opinion, about developing manufacturing capacity for vaccines all over the world. So we're not dependent on a few big companies um, in some countries, you know, eventually getting around to making it for everyone else. It should be that there's more um, independence and the ability for, for regions to make enough vaccine for themselves. That really should be an important goal. 
And then you have the access to treatment, which is right now not, uh, I think, particularly equitable as it scales up. And again, I think figuring out a way when there's such a central treatment for there to be production and um, scaling, um, not just in one country or a couple of countries, but around the world has to be really important. So I, I think that we are, you know, still working our way through COVID and we're still not quite learning the key lessons. And as a result, we're still going to see um, a lot of uh, challenges in the next uh, few months to even a couple of years until it really starts to go into the rear view mirror. I hope that we can switch into learning the lessons of COVID rather than just experiencing the lessons of COVID, experiencing the, the challenges. But that's really gonna depend on what happens in the next short time. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, it's always good to hear, like, give for you to give us a little bit of an overview kind of of where we stand right now. Um, so given that we have surpassed 1 million deaths uh, due to COVID in the United States and over 6 million deaths globally, what do you think were our nation's and international community's biggest weaknesses that caused us to get to this point? So there are a few different ways to think about the weaknesses. You know, we can think about the weaknesses in our preparation. And we certainly were not, you know, as prepared as we would like to be. Um, we um, could have uh, identified the virus quicker, warned people quicker, you know, controlled the spread of the virus faster. So there was a lot about the preparation um, that was was lacking. But then once the vi the virus came up, there there was. Um, problems at different levels. You know, one of the biggest problems has been international uh, collaboration. Um, we have every country sort of gone its own way. And sometimes every country thinks that, you know, what happened somewhere else isn't going to happen here. And then it does happen there. And everybody acts surprised. Um, in certain countries like the United States, we've had a very terrible um, experience in part because of just the weakness of the public health infrastructure. The story is different in other countries. We see some other countries which have strong public health departments, strong testing um, abilities, and also, um, you know, uh, a lot of ability to do outreach, particularly to people who are um, vulnerable to uh, severe infections. And, and those countries have done a lot better than the United States, which has failed uh, by and large in those regards. And then there's kind of the intangible. You know, there was an interesting study um, in the Lancet Journal about trust in COVID. And one of the things that predicts whether a country had a better experience or worse experience uh, was trust. Um, trust in government, trust in science, you know? And so in countries where people are like, I don't believe that. And the thing that they don't believe is that a vaccine could save their life. You're gonna get more deaths because people aren't gonna get vaccinated. Whereas in other countries where people hear, you know, it's a good idea to wear a mask and everyone puts on a mask because they trust that, you know, you see a lot fewer deaths. So. It, it's that, that, that's a difficult one because of course, we're living in a world where public health isn't the only issue. We have a lot of issues uh, with trust in many countries, including the United States, with polarization, with misinformation and all the crazy ideas out there. I'll just tell you, um, I'm very happy to be talking to you all. Um, I Not too long ago, a few weeks ago, I did a session on C-SPAN, which is a US television network. And I didn't realize that when I was doing it, I had signed up to be on TV. I thought they would just be like doing a question and answer like this. I didn't realize they would be opening the phone lines, you know? So anyone could call in, which I was like, okay, they told me that while I was live on the air. They're like, oh, we're gonna let anybody call in. So the very first question I got, let's see if I can find it here. The very first question I got was this. I'm gonna read it verbatim because Otherwise, I will not do it justice. Hello, doctor. I was calling to find out if the new variant is connected to the World Economic Forum and Charles Schwab and microchipping the public in order to tie it to the new banking system. So that was the first question I got. And I had to answer right away, you know? And so, you know, when you have that kind of, you know, misinformation, disinformation, I don't even know where to start with that question. Um, then it's going to make it much harder to be able to do things. And so, you know, there were some people who thought, look, it all is about making a vaccine. That might be like the, you know, 
pure science approach. Like we have an enemy, the enemy is a virus. We're making a vaccine for it. We're making a treatment, then we're done. But if you're in public health and you're thinking in public health, that's just the beginning of being done. You know, that's just the beginning. We have to reach people where they are. We have to work with people in their communities. We have to be able to gain their trust. We need to invest in every single step of delivering life-saving medicines um, or people won't take them. They won't have access to them or they won't believe them. And if you do that, you know, it, it's just a disaster. And that's what we've seen in many places. Yeah, thank you so much for especially emphasizing the fact that, you know, the shortcomings that we've seen are kind of due to various different things kind of all playing together. Um, so given your experience and involvement in so many public health issues at various levels, what has surprised you the most about the public's response to the pandemic and the public health approaches that have been implemented? What has surprised me the most? I mean, I think that there's some level, I, I thought, you know, if you had asked me um, at the beginning, I would have said that one of, I, in fact, I'll tell you this other story, which is right at the beginning of the pandemic, I was getting a lot of calls from the media because I'd written a book about public health crises. And so people thought that like I was an expert in public health crisis. So everybody was calling me and I hardly was sleeping. And late one night, I got a call from the host of one of my favorite podcasts. I was like, I'm going to get to be on that podcast. That is so exciting. And so he talked to me like late at night. It was like an hour long call. I just remember as it being this really intense conversation. And then I forgot about it. And like a month later, I was like, I wonder if I'm ever going to be on that podcast. And I called or I emailed and they wrote back and said, we took the show in a different direction. And I was like, okay, fine. I guess I'm not going to be on that podcast. But then like two years later, I thought, wouldn't it be cool to hear that interview again? Like, what was I saying? It was right at the beginning. And so I, um, I got the tape. And I listened to it. And there I was, you know, had no idea. It was, very, it was very early in March 2020. And I said some things that I think were right. I said, there's a public part of public health. And whether the public can come together, I didn't call it trust exactly, but whether the public can come together is going to be really important. It is for every public health issue. And I'm worried, given the state of the U.S., we're talking about the U.S. and the state of politics in the U.S., whether we can really come together. You know, and, and that's going to be important. So, okay, I'll give myself a point for that. But then I said something like, you know, if it's really serious and people are dying, then people will recognize how important it is, you know, to, to take action, at least for themselves. And I think what surprised me is just how, and maybe it shouldn't have, but how severe people's uh, misunderstanding or willful mis being misled can be that even when they are dying of COVID, people have refused to believe it. And, you know, there's some incredible videos taken in the intensive care unit with people like they're struggling to breathe right there. And they're saying, I'm not so sure I would take the vaccine, even knowing what I know. And they're like, they're going to die in a couple of days. Like it says two days later, this person was dead and they still don't want to do it. And they still, you know, and they're the, the way that, you know, um, uh, misunderstanding can affect just absolutely horrible decisions that people make for their own health. It's just so tragic. And I, it, I think the, the level of that really has, has surprised me. You know, at the, I, I wish I weren't surprised by sort of the selfishness in some respects that we've seen at different levels of the pandemic and the fact that countries sometimes have struggled to see the bigger picture that if we work together, we can reduce, you know, the overall burden rather than viewing it as like, a, Hunger Games kind of situation. Um, but uh, I do think that, um, you know, so maybe I didn't have that high hopes. So I haven't been too, too disappointed at the beginning. Um, I, I guess I was surprised that, uh, the, that we could make vaccines so quickly. And, and so that was a pleasant surprise. And so, so, you know, it's been a combination of things. It's been, it's been uh, each day, each week, you know, we're learning about the virus. The virus has been surprising in some respects. We have to be able to have a strong and nimble public health response in order to be on top of it. Yeah, thank you for those comments, Dr. Sharstein. So um, despite living through and um, combating the pandemic for over two years, um, what do you think are some lessons that um, policymakers, 
and politicians um, still have yet to learn? Well, I can certainly start with the United States. I think the biggest one is that we ignore public health at our own peril. You know, the United States were famous for spending a lot to deal with the consequences of, you know, medical problems and spending almost nothing to prevent them. I mean, it's a, you know, we, we see with just this horrific, horrific couple of weeks we've had on gun violence, just how profound our willing, our ability in this country is to avoid prevention. You know, we should be preventing these horrible shootings. We shouldn't be figuring out how to, you know, spending all our time on uh, figuring out how to make a school impervious to a school shooting. It's impossible, you know. But that 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 occurs with the um, the healthcare system too. We spend in the United States, you know, more than ninety seven percent, ninety seven cents on every dollar for taking care of people after they get sick, and only about three percent for prevention, more or less. And you know that can work if you're, if you're willing, first of all, to die younger, which the United States does, even though we spend so much more, we're in the 60s in terms of like the 65th country for life expectancy, 65th, even though we spend way more than everyone else on health, but that's because we spend it all afterwards after people get sick and so little on prevention. Um, but when you think about that, not just at the individual level, so the United States, we're, we, as a society, we spend so much on health for individuals. You can, I guess, do that if you're willing to die a little earlier and spend a ton of money once people get sick. But what happens when you do that at the society level? You don't invest in core you know, systems that keep the whole society protected. Then you're very vulnerable to a huge pandemic and a million people die, plus a million more, you know, more than a million. And so I think one of the biggest lessons here is um, even if we're not going to change the healthcare system completely, we should um, invest in a public health system that is preventing severe effects for the community and focusing particularly on uh, communities that are, are uh, particularly at risk. And so um, I think, I hope, and I'm working on a number of different projects now to say, look, it's not just that we need a better surveillance system for a pandemic. We need better surveillance systems for everything. We need to know more about diabetes. We need to know more about addiction and overdose. We need to know more about shootings. You know, all those things we need to understand better. We need to see what's happening so that we can actually get prevention going across the community. And when we do that, every day we'll be in a better position when another pandemic happens. If we do nothing, we'll be in a worse position. And if we just pretend, well, let's you know, create a plan for something that might or might not happen 20 years from now, we're not gonna be able to, to really use that plan well. So I think the biggest lesson is to invest in a public health system. Um, and you know, related to that is the um, real importance of thinking about equity in the public health response. You know, um, I, don't, I probably stopped counting the number of times something happened in the pandemic and the groups that were already the most vulnerable got it the worst, you know? So when we started, started out, there was a little period right at the beginning where the only people getting COVID were coming back from cruises, you know? People were like, oh, this is the cruising disease. It's not really the cruising disease. This is the United States, you know, it was going to get to um, poor communities, discriminated against communities and have a much pe people who didn't have, uh, who were living in crowded apartments or had to work frontline jobs. And so, you know, the, the number of infections, the access to testing, the access to treatment, the access to high quality treatment, the access to vaccines, every single time there was something new with the pandemic, it was hitting a certain communities harder and our ability to protect all of society is inherently linked to our ability to protect the society, the, the, the communities that are most affected. And you know, I think that's a really important lesson for society. It's also a very important lesson for public health. You just can't have a plan on the shelf. You have to be doing good work, um, helping and supporting and advocating with and mobilizing with communities that are at greatest risk if you're gonna be in a better position for the challenges we face and another pandemic.
Yeah, hello. Um, my name is Tanvi and uh, I'm a rising sophomore in Arizona. Um, my question for the doctor, which uh, thank you by the way for uh, sharing your time and like talking with us about this. It's really important to highlight how much misinformation can like affect people all over the world. My question is, how do you think the best way is to counteract this public stigma of COVID-19 and conspiracy theories to ensure that people have the safest and most reliable source of understanding the true facts about the virus and its implications? Yeah, that is such a great question. And I really wish there were an easy answer. I'll tell you some answers to that question. Um, you know, when I'm on TV, or I'm not just on TV, I actually go out and vaccinate in Baltimore with the Baltimore City Health Department as a volunteer. And I'm talking to people who don't want to get vaccinated because they have, they're completely misinformed. You know, I, I try to do a few things. First of all, I do want to directly answer their question like, no, the variants are not a conspiracy by Charles Schwab in the US banking system. You know, I mean, but I don't spend a lot of time on that. I just say, I don't believe that, you know, there's no evidence for that. But then I try to focus on things that, you know, I, I give an answer. This is what variants are, you know, uh, bacteria and viruses are constantly mutating. And sometimes they hit on a mutation that, that actually allows it to uh, infect more people. And so we see one mutant, you know, of the virus after another. The good news is we can protect ourselves from the, from the virus and we can reduce the number of mutations that happen the more people get vaccinated. That's why it's really important for people to be vaccinated. And then I try to bridge that a little to, that's why virtually every physician has been vaccinated in this country because they know the value of the vaccine, you know? And I try to like, maybe appeal to places or people that they might listen to. Um, that's what you're doing in an individual communication. Interestingly, when I go out and I talk to people and they're like, they're standing there, you know, with their arms crossed, they're not at all interested. You know, I, som I sometimes don't go at it by trying to argue with them like a scientist, you know, like, let me tell you how many patients were in the clinical studies. Some people want to know, I'll tell them you know, how many patients were in the clinical studies or how those clinical studies were organized. But often what I do is I'll say, I try to engage them at a different level altogether. And I'll say, look, I hear you. You're not interested in getting vaccinated today. But if you were going to be vaccinated, who would you get vaccinated for? And some people kind of step, step back and think, well, I mean, I get vaccinated for my mom. It's like, why would you get vaccinated for your mom? Well, because she's not doing so well. She has cancer. She has this problem, you know, wouldn't want her to get sick. I mean, you know, that's, that's pretty good. A lot of people get vaccinated to protect other people, you know? And then suddenly it's like a different kind of conversation. So I think like, you know, it, it's hard. And we have students at the School of Public Health whose parents won't get vaccinated, right? They, they're paying for their child to get, you know, educated and they themselves won't get vaccinated. And it's so frustrating. So it's very, very hard, even for the people in their own family sometimes to convince them but sometimes you can get through, and I've definitely had some success there. I think what we want to do, in addition to that individual interaction, is work with trusted people in communities wherever you can. We, we, I interviewed at one point the Mississippi Health Commissioner, and he said, you know, where we can get the local preacher to talk about vaccines, we can get a lot more people vaccinated. Where the local preacher is saying all kinds of, you know, misinformed things about vaccines, it's really hard. So in public health, we have to think about not just the individual, but who that individual is trusting and try to develop a coalition that can be very helpful to um, getting people to turn away from what they you know, read on Facebook because what they're hearing from people they trust around them is different. So that's, that's the challenge, it is not solved. It may be your generation that figures out what to do with this, but it is, it is really, really hard right now. Um, hi, I'm Hal, and I'm a rising senior from Toronto, Canada. Just first off, thank you so much for the seminar. I found it very, very interesting. Um, so you talked about how misinformation could cause vaccine hesitancy and distrust, and I found this very intriguing because I actually recently also read an article about distrust, and it can be caused by many things like misinformation, but also past injustices, like how in the past Western researchers would like immorally use African Americans as guinea pigs to test their vaccines, which kind of entrenched this like deeply ingrained fear into 
distrust for these Western made vaccines. And I was just curious, like, what do you think are ways for us as a society to rectify these past wrongs and also respectfully reproach these people who have been wronged in the past in order to persuade them to get vaccinated? Thanks. That's a great question. And I think it's important not only to say that you're right, that there are past wrongs that have affected this, but there are current wrongs that affect this that affect this. In, in, in many cities, for example, people don't feel welcome in certain hospitals. Um, you know, you can tell me whether that's the case in Canada. It's certainly the case in the United States. Um, that uh, at one point, the, the former health commissioner in Baltimore City uh, told me that when they sent, um, this is a little bit after I was health commissioner, they sent um, people to go door to door during a particular crisis. And people said, um, oh, you must be here to enroll me in a research study. Like the only time they really interacted in their own community with, with, with uh, um, the health department or with um, academic research centers was over a research study, not because of anything that could make a difference to them. And so there is reason why people can be quite distrustful that's justified from what they're going through today and not just history. So I think the beginning of a response to that is to fix the problems that are going on today, not to view it purely as a historical exercise, to um, open clinics um, in communities to diversify the medical field. So people can really relate to more people that they're engaging with in the healthcare system. And then at the same time, you know, it's important to be honest about what has happened and the kinds of injustices that have happened. One of the more effective things in the United States that happened, interesting, there was a big gap, for example, between Black Americans um, and white Americans in vaccination initially, but that gap really closed. Same with Hispanic Americans. And one of the reasons for that was a really serious campaign in, that included a lot of Black physicians, for example, um, recording a gazillion videos, going to a lot of church services, really um, doing incredible work. And in the, you know, I've seen some of those messages, they acknowledge the history, they don't deny the history, but they still talk about the importance of getting vaccinated and why they have trust in the vaccine. So I think it, it really has to be responded to at different levels, really acknowledging that it's not just a historical problem. Hi, so yeah, my name is Maite. I am from Manawa, Nicaragua, and I am a rising junior. So um, this question kind of connects to um, where I live, kind of what, what I've lived through. So I wanted to ask about governments who, and we talked a little bit about this in the last um in the last talk with Dr. Quinn and in the chat, I wanted to ask about the intersectionality and how we can kind of um, move forward in countries that maybe have a more corrupt government in which we feel like, you know, our government is keeping these opportunities away from us and trying to um, kind of move us away from progressing into, you know, leaving this pandemic kind of in the rearview mirror and preventing us from getting these opportunities to get vaccinated and giving us a lot of misinformation directly from them because that's something that's been happening you know, lately um, in my country. So I wanted to kind of get your take on that and maybe past examples, that kind of thing. Yeah, well, um, first of all, thank you for, for asking that question. I've been to Nicaragua, it's a beautiful, beautiful country. Um, you know, what's very interesting, and look, this is not just for countries outside the US. In the US, we've had this challenge. You know, you can say, well, what we just need is for people to trust the government. Of course, if the government's saying something that isn't right, then maybe we don't want people just to trust the government, right? It just shows how complicated the situation is. And there were times when the United States, the White House, was saying things that were completely wrong. So it's very hard to, um, you know, to say, oh, it's, it's a simple answer here. Um, and the issue of what to do when you have major institutions of different kinds saying things that are not in the end uh, really in the interest of public health, it, it's, it's a hard one. And I don't think I could presume to give an answer about the best, best way to do this. Um, you know, ultimately, we hope that, that um, people uh, will be able to inspire their government to do a better job. 
In the meantime, it may be just through individual conversations, you're able to protect as many people as you can. But, you know, in certain countries doing uh, work where you're saying something different than the government could be quite dangerous. And so you have to be very careful, you know, in, in thinking about it. Um, there is a lot of, um, there are a lot of heroes around the world who have um, taken on this challenge and, and tried to, you know, get people good information about what's going on. Um, there's certain governments that almost made it like their signature to deny the existence of COVID, refuse to acknowledge any COVID deaths in their statistics. I'm thinking of some countries in a different part of the world right now, but, you know, um, and as a result, a lot of people died. And so, you know, how do you fight back the things you can do in your own life? There are ways that you can organize with others, but everything in the appropriate context so that, you know, you can um, be safe, which is very important. And, uh, and be in a position to do more when the opportunity arises. Hi, um, my name is Sarah. I'm from New Jersey and I'm a rising sophomore. And I was wondering um, how you think polarization has affected misinformation and the response to the pandemic. And if you have any thoughts on how to solve it. Sure, you. so, um, you know, I've been in a position where I was managing different crises of different kinds and the facts change in the middle of it, you know? Like your understanding of something changes. You know, we learn that um, masks have a huge value in the middle of you know the pandemic. Or I'm trying to think of a good example from from my career. Um, you know, we learn that um, Ebola can be transmitted in a U.S. hospital if there isn't good um, uh, infection control practice. You know that that we're more vulnerable to things than we think. And so, you know, it's first of all, when I'm up in front of the cameras or I've got, you know, a bunch of microphones, like I try to be a little bit humble and I say like, this is what I know now and that could change. And I hope that people trust me enough that if the situation does change, they will remember that I said it might change and that I'm not, you know, announcing things. But if you put something into a polarized environment, where people wake up in the morning trying to tear down, probably not tear down me, but tear down my boss if I'm working for the governor or the mayor. And that's their entire mission. And they just want people to you know, vote them out. That's it. Then they will say, anytime anything changes, that's just flip-flopping. Dr. Sharfstein doesn't know what he's thinking. Why do we have an incompetent person in that job? And that can get quite loud. you know. And of course, it can now permeate different tracks of, it can be on social media, it can be on certain TV stations and radio stations. And so trying to be an honest, fair explainer of science that is changing in the middle of a polarized society, it may be impossible. I don't know how it can be done. I'll be honest with you, I just don't know. I think, I think it poses a really serious threat. You know, This kind of polarization poses a really serious threat for us to be able to protect democracy. It poses a really serious threat to be able to reduce gun violence. It, it is threatening you know, our society in ways I've never seen in my life. And one of the impacts is on public health and our ability to come together. You know, I mean, I trust Dr. Fauci because I've known him for a long time. Um, and I know that he is doing the best that he can with the evidence that he has at the moment. And there's an entire industry you know, now trying to vilify him and tear him down that has nothing to do with really what he's saying or how honest he's been, but just for, to score political points. I don't, you know, I don't know that we have the answer to that right now. And I probably, we're gonna have to find a way to heal some of the problems in society as the first, that's the real, you know, intervention. What we can do in public health is almost like, you know, just uh, stemming the bleeding a little bit, but not really tending to the, the cause of the problem. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Nana. I'm a rising junior from Toronto, Ontario, and thank you, Dr. Sharfstein, for coming in. Um, my question, well, because I'm from Toronto, I'm in Ontario in Canada, so we were locked down a lot longer than a lot of other parts of the world. That led to a lot of unrest within Ontario, especially. So my question is, um, how would the um, given that what we know now, how would you say that the government responses should change? Should we enter another pandemic, particularly around lockdowns and misinformation, especially because I'm Asian and I faced a lot of anti-Asian discrimination and racism over the course of the pandemic because of misinformation from governments and leaders. So how would we change that if we were to enter another pandemic? 
It's a great question. And, um, you know, I, I think, I think one of the things that we've learned is that we um, have to balance the ability of people to live their lives and at least do some basic things with infection control at all times. When this started, we were so unprepared for what was happening. I don't think we'll be that unprepared again. And I think that governments will particularly not be so unprepared with respect to testing. So one of the reasons everything got shut down completely was nobody knew how much was out there. I don't know if you remember like walking around outside and wondering whether it was in the trees. You know, I, I actually had somebody call my office and say, I, I think we should ban leaf blowers in this country. And I was like, ban leaf blowers? But like, yes, because we, I think that the leaves, when they blow the leaves, they're just blowing the virus everywhere and we're all getting sick from it. You know, just people were just so unsure of what's happening. I, I don't think we'll be at that level again. And I think hopefully that will lead to less, you know, um, overly broad uh, responses, even if we're dealing with severe illnesses. Now, there may be a period where a real shutdown and as much activity as possible is necessary, but hopefully that will be based on data right there, not just this fear that we had because we didn't know what was going on. Um, you know, I do think that the, um, the discrimination and racism that has happened from the pandemic is just, you know, absolutely horrible and another symptom of just, you know, the, um, the state of our you know, society and misinformation um, and how to overcome that. I'll tell you when I was um, the health secretary of Maryland, we had this fear of um, Ebola. Now I'm thinking how old you guys are. So possibly you were in the elementary school, maybe first or second grade when there was this uh, Ebola outbreak in West Africa. And you may recall that um, a few cases got into the United States. There was a little bit of transmission in Dallas and people just freaked out completely. And there was some polarization at the time. So there were people who were running for office. It was right before a midterm election um, who were just trying to just make everybody scared and saying public health was incompetent and what was going on. And, and there, were, um, there was a lot of posturing and there was a lot of racism, particularly against African immigrants. And something that we did in Maryland, Governor Martin O'Malley was very, very worried about that possibility of discrimination and racism. And what he did is he brought in, um, he, there was actually an African immigrant, sorry about that, an African immigrant um, uh, co uh, committee that worked in Maryland and he brought their leadership in. He met with them publicly. He said he totally supported the community. He brought them into meetings. And then we had press conferences they were always there and they were reassuring their community, but everybody could see how much we were working together and that this was sort of a common response. And I think that it did, it did help. I think um, the other thing that was really important in the governor followed that in other states in the United States at the time, um, the governor, even democratic governors <laughs> were putting police cars outside the homes of immigrants who had just gotten back from West Africa. Um, just in case they went outside, you know, they were supposed to be quarantining at home. And that really freaked out, you know, people. And it was really a signal not of distrust. Um, we did not do that in Maryland. I felt very strongly about that, that we could trust people. And we work with a lot of community organizations to do that. So I think it's something that you have to recognize. And um, in public health, we really have to be thoughtful about, you know, how to reduce the chance of that happening. Um, so hi, Dr. Jarstein. Um well, it should be good afternoon for you, but it's good evening for me here. So I'm Andy, and I'm a rising junior studying in the Philippines. And I just wanted to thank you for being here today. And I know at the start of this session, you were talking a bit about some issues on decentralizing like vaccine production and how certain countries just don't have the infrastructure mm -hmm. to distribute vaccines that they've received. And current, given that I'm currently living in the Philippines, um, where we've had like the longest lockdowns in the world and we still lack a lot of the infrastructure um, to distribute those vaccines. How would you suggest, so like low income countries and le less developed countries such as the Philippines deal with these types of situations aside from just receiving aid from more wealthy countries? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, you know, as my remarks indicated, I totally agree with your premise that 
it shouldn't just be waiting to get aid from more wealthy countries. And, you know, you could, um, th there are investments that the Philippines with global partners could make in local vaccine capacity that could be good for COVID vaccines, but also other kinds of vaccines. And really shifting vaccine capacity, like, like you know, the other pandemic that we're still kind of worried about is a flu pandemic, influenza. You know, there are pandemic strains of flu. That was what killed millions of people in the beginning of the 20th century. And, you know, we could get another pandemic influenza tomorrow. Um, you know, there is not nearly enough flu vaccine manufacturing capacity in the world to give people vaccine. And um, we were very fortunate to get the vaccine capacity that we have because of the mRNA vaccines. Then they don't exist yet for flu. And so um, we would hope that it works for flu, but we don't know. So in some respects, we're behind. So really thinking about vaccine capacity and the infrastructure that it could provide. And I think this is an issue for the world community to be supporting local capacity, but also thinking about it, not just for the next pandemic, but for all the things it could be used for. You know, there's, um, I'm, I don't know the statistics for the Philippines, but I would imagine it does not have a very high annual flu vaccine rate. And probably a lot of people die from flu. And so you could save lives every year as you're building your capacity to be ready for another pandemic. I, I think it's a very important thing for global health. Thank you, Dr. Charstein, and thank you for the question, Andy. Um, so I see we still have 27 or so hands raised, and um, just to be respectful of Dr. Sharfstein's time, we may, are there any resources you'd recommend the students turn to in case they can't have their questions answered, Dr. Sharfstein? Well, um, I hope um, people can go to coronavirus.jhu.edu and sign up for some newsletters that uh, provide a lot of great information, like the Expert Insights newsletter. They can check us out at Public Health on Call, send us feedback on what episodes you'd like in Public Health on Call. Um, through public health question at jhu.edu. Um, I think those are those are definitely uh, good things to do. But what do you want to do? You want to how about this? You want to do like uh, rapid fire? Um, sure. We'll, let's, let's, fire let's see if we, we'll go till two. And why don't you just call on people and ask the question quickly? And I'll give my best answer. I'm just so appreciative. It's amazing. You have so many uh, great people on the line here. Yeah, hello, um, Dr. Sharfstein. So my um, quick question is that, so acknowledging that our ultimate goal is to reach um, equity in the health of everyone on Earth. So would you value changing the legislation or maybe um, on exporting vaccines or even enhancing the social infrastructure? Or would you value more making better vaccines and stopping the pandemic first? Um, I think that we're at the moment right now where it's extremely important to get vaccines around the world. So I would be emphasizing that right now. Um, I think it is um, also true that we need to be thinking about vaccines for some of these variants, you know, but we know that the current vaccines we have provide a lot of protection from serious illness and death. So I would probably be doing a little of both, but a, a lot of getting the current vaccines around the world. And we don't know yet whether we can make other vaccines that are more effective, but I would be studying that too. Yeah, so um, my quick question is, uh, would it be better for governments to rule with like an iron fist, creating long lockdowns, having curfews like in Montreal, while risking worse mental health in the people? Or is it better to have a more lenient government that has perhaps worse quarantines, but better mental health outcomes? Um, that is a very good question. Um, you know, it really depends on the circumstances. You know, one of the areas where I could be asking you guys questions because you're the experts in what happened in schools, right? So, I mean, another way of thinking about that very question is, is it better to be more protective of kids in school, even at the consequence of having to wear masks or, or erring on the side of closing schools if there's a lot of transmission? Or is it better to allow there to be a lot of transmission and have a lot of people get sick, but then maybe kids are more able to... Um, you know, experience their peers and be back in school, the being kept out of school is just devastating for a lot of kids. So, you know, my view on this is that it's really important to recognize the trade-off that you have just talked about and to throw resources at minimizing it. That's something we did not do well in the pandemic. So for example, for schools, it was really important to open schools. And I think it was a huge failure that we kept them closed for so long in the United States. However, 
we did not throw resources to really help schools do this safely. If you look at what some private schools did, they did crazy amounts of spending to protect the kids that were there. Public schools did not get that money until the very, very end of 2020. It was refused to be given by Congress and the, the president at the time, it, it didn't come through. And so uh, think about like um, bars and restaurants, for example, when we didn't have a vaccine and, vac and the virus was spreading really fast, bars and restaurants were a huge source of continued spread. Now you close bars and restaurants, you really affect the people who work at bars and restaurants. You make it really hard for people to get together. What do you do? Well, that, that is a trade-off. There's a lot of tension. At a minimum, you should throw resources right there. I think it could have been helpful to you know, help bars and restaurants to expand outside, but also to provide um, financial compensation for people if you're going to have to close them down. So you know, my view is sometimes the right answer is a bigger lockdown because it would just be so devastating to have all these people dead. And that's kind of traumatic for mental health too. You know, On the other hand, Sometimes you have to say, look, we're going to go forward, but we're going to try to make it as safe as possible. But the key is to realize that is the key decision and put resources right where you're going to make it as easy as possible to, uh, you know, to, to, to get both goals met. Uh, thank you. Uh, so as somebody who personally moved from Chicago to South Korea, over 6,000 miles away during a global pandemic, I got the opportunity to see the drastic views of misinformation spread through social media and the way that different countries uh, were regulating that, I guess, through social media. But I wanted to ask you, in your opinion, do you think social media is helping or hindering global pandemics in general? Um, and do you think, like, in terms of the future, if there were another global pandemic or really in any terms of any uh, public health issue, is there a better way to regulate information posted via social media that allows for, like, decreased spread of information as well as decreased, I guess, um, like inspiration for more considered reckless behavior during pandemics? Can I just ask you, what was the biggest difference in how misinformation was handled between Chicago and South Korea? It was certainly very different to see versus like Illinois where I'm from and Chicago and seeing the countless posts about just everybody's public opposition view, mm -hmm. um, different opinions colliding on social media that didn't really allow for anyone to have true information. Um, versus in from my experience in South Korea, a lot of posts that people were making were either blocked by government that I wasn't allowed to see or that were being taken down by social media in Korea in general because of the misinformation. Yeah, that is so interesting. Um, you know, you, you, you should think about that experience you've had because it is unusual to see both places. Um, I think that um, we have not figured out in the United States at least how to um, manage social media in a healthy way. And that it re reflects both the direct mental health impacts it has on a lot of young people and older people, frankly, but particularly young people, as well as the misinformation issues. Um, I don't think I could say that it's been a net positive. Um, you know, the number one shared Facebook post was a, a misinformation about a doctor who allegedly died of a COVID vaccine. Number one, you know, shared gazillions of times. Um, and so, that information can just be so, so damaging to the response. Um, and you know how best to um, control social media. One of the challenges is that you know, by its nature and by its design, high emotion content gets shared easier. You know, and or like, like somebody, I, we talked at one point in one of my classes, we brought an FBI expert in disinformation and misinformation to our class. And he said, you know, they've done these experiments. I don't know if this is true. That's what he said. Like, if they show you two videos, like President Biden tells the latest information about the coronavirus or a fake video, like it says, this is a fake video of President Biden, you know, um, uh, singing a song about why you shouldn't get vaccinated against coronavirus. People will click on the second link, even though they know it's fake. If they don't know it's fake, they'll still click on the link. Like, it's just like, wow, that's unusual. You know, it's just, I wanna see a fake video of President Biden singing something that's wrong. You know, it, it is just, it's just the way people engage on social media and the design of social media, if they're algorithms that share content that's, you know, misinformation, we have to get to the bottom of it and figure out ways to protect ourselves. Otherwise, you know, we're, we're just lost in this 
sea of falsehoods and the consequences are just terrible for health and for well-being. Uh, hello. So this is kind of similar to the prior question, but I have like many relatives that have fallen prey to misinformation. So do you believe that the government should intervene with potentially lethal information? Um, intervene. What was that last part? Do you think they should intervene with like uh, potentially lethal information? Oh, misinformation. Uh, yeah. Oh, I see. To stop mm -hmm. lethal misinformation. Mm -hmm. I think that there should be rules, you know, and whether it's the government that that is really on the front lines of that or whether there's a, you know, some somewhat distance from the government um, approach uh, that sets standards. I do think mm -hmm. that there should be rules and the rules should apply not just to the individual post, but to the algorithms that the social media companies use, which I think are, are very fundamental. And I also think there should be outcome data so we can see, you know, um, the quantity of misinformation still out there um, we can be nimble and try to respond to it. I think that this is a threat to society. And of course, it's a threat not just to health, but to democracy and, and other really important things in our lives. So so figuring this out is, is extremely important and uh, we haven't yet. So in general, I noticed that different countries have been like implementing different policies during the pandemic to reduce the spread and also like different countries have like ideas of the extent that we should go to to reduce the spread. But like in your opinion, like are there any countries that we can look to as a good example of how to mitigate the virus? But then like also are these policies sustainable in the long run? Sure. Well, you know, there's some I don't want to go, I couldn't do it. every country, but like countries like Australia, New Zealand, you know, were able to to do take some pretty severe action, very seriously limit the spread, which allowed people to go out for most of the pandemic. Occasionally there were shutdowns, but you know, they kept the virus away. And then they made a pivot when vaccines were available, when they had enough to vaccinate their population that they would change and learn to live with the virus. They wouldn't try to keep it out completely. I think they probably had it the best. Like the number of people who died per capita in those countries is extremely low. Um, I'm familiar with Norway, another example. Um, there are certainly countries, um, South Korea, um, Japan, uh, that have also had um, relatively mild courses. And they've done this through some pretty aggressive moves that really dramatically reduced transmission initially, and then switching gears. So they were able to switch, you know? You look at a country like China, it has not been able to switch. You know, it was extremely aggressive, far more aggressive than any other countries in terms of what it took to shut down the, the virus to spread, um, you know, think doing things that we would not do, for example, in the United States, but then um, they have not been able to pivot and they're really in trouble um, with these new variants. So it's, it's, uh, it's both required good judgment and also the ability to change that judgment. And so it's, it's hard, um, it's hard, but I do think there's some examples of countries that have been able to do that. Hi, um, first of all, thank you so much for um, giving us your time. It was really interesting to hear everything you said. Um, my question is, obviously, since the beginning of the pandemic, a lot has changed with vaccination and misinformation and how much, you know, we're going out and wearing masks and things like that. What do you expect for like the next 10 to 20 years and like the mitigation of the pandemic and how we'll move on with our lives? That's a great question and a good last question, too. Um, so I actually think that, you know, think about how we dealt with the weather. You know, the weather actually affects our lives quite a lot. You know, we change what we do on a daily basis based on the weather. We change how we dress. We change whether we're carrying an umbrella. We change whether we do outdoor activities. And we don't view that as this like horrific imposition on our freedom, right? It's like, well, it's gonna rain. So I'm gonna not plan to have a picnic or I'm gonna bring an umbrella somewhere. I think that in the future, we'll see these infectious disease threats more like the weather. Hopefully we'll actually get, um, uh, we'll get predictions like the weather, we'll get forecasts. Um, during part, parts of the year, we may do things differently like wear masks when we're indoors or um, bump our elbows hello instead of shaking, you know? Um, and that hopefully that will become more routine. And we'll do it because we, you know, eventually maybe the next generation won't even remember why they're doing it, but it'll just become part of our culture to, to take more precautions at certain times. And, you know, it may be that you're watching the news and they'll say like, 
you know, we're entering two weeks of heavy flu season. So pack your masks, everybody, and just like pack your umbrella or pack your galoshes, you know. So I, I hope that that's kind of the effect on our daily lives. And I hope that underneath that is a strong public health system that can make those predictions, that can get the data, that can do extra things for communities that really need it, that has worked to reduce the risks of those surges to communities in the greatest uh, harm's way. Um, and so a combination of changes in culture and a stronger public health system, I think would be what I would hope for at least, but it's gonna be you guys that can make that happen. So um, thanks so much for the chance to uh, come talk with you all. And uh, as you guys get further into thinking about public health as a career, you should reach out to me, think about Johns Hopkins, um, think about the field of public health more generally. And I really, really wish uh, you the best. I wish I could take three more hours and just keep answering questions, but we'll find other ways to do that. Mm.